Tim Burton is gone. Michael Keaton is gone. Now let's watch the replacements try and make sure Batman goes on for a really long time in Batman. Forever! 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 Riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black bat? In an uncertain world, in a chaotic time, justice wears a mask. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at JeromeC1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four- or five-star review. So just to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at The Real World are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you can do so in two ways. First, send an email to SuperheroPantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at HeroPantheon. Let's do a little bit of house cleaning right away here. This is typically the week when we would be reviewing Spider-Man Far From Home. However, there are two other real-world podcasts that will be tackling this film, including Big Spideas with Mike Thomas and Matt Waters. Matt Waters will also be talking about the film with Ben Phillips on their Ben and Matt's Marvelous Journey podcast. Say that three times fast. So we decided that we would not review that movie in, in full, uh, but we will probably try to do a segment on it next week, maybe answer some burning questions about it. So there will not be a full Spider-Man review, but next week we're going to be talking about Batman and Robin. So that is a fitting place to talk. No, it's really not. But we're probably going to talk at least a little bit about Spider-Man next week. My co-host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, I have to be honest, you, you blew my mind when you mentioned the Seal song, Kiss on a Rose, a song that I have heard, of course, but I'm not a musically savvy person, so I never really had the connection between this film and the music video, and the moment that I watched the music video, my mind was completely blown, it almost completely changed my legacy score. Yeah, so I remember Batman Forever as a kid, as a big kind of moment because I was, what, six years old and I was going to the local theater that's no longer there. I actually work a block away from that theater now. But, uh, yeah, it was kind of a big deal because, you know, I watched Batman uh, Returns when I was three years old in the theater. Couldn't remember shit from it because, like we said last week, it's not really meant for kids. It doesn't really stick well. But they tried to make it for kids in this one, and it kind of stuck out even though I kind of blocked out a lot of the beginning of the movie, which was just totally horrible with that Mort-like character from Family Guys, the security guard. But... Nonetheless, uh, I still remember the song. It was all over the place. MTV was playing that music video all the time, and uh, it was just all over the place. So you couldn't deny it. I, I say credit to the merchandising department because, I mean, it was all over the place. I was getting the toys from McDonald's. I saw the commercials all the time. This movie was more about the marketing, I think, than the actual movie itself, even though, you know, it did perform well, but I think that's just because Batman was kind of the draw at the time, and a lot of kids were seeing it for the toys. That is for sure, and just to take people behind the scenes, this is the second time that we are taking a crack at recording a Batman Forever podcast, because the the movie gods have apparently deemed it worthy for us to talk about this movie twice. So the first podcast has been lost out of the ether, among the millions of podcasts that have been lost, 
it is uh, there, it is somewhere up in the clouds, never to be heard from again. So Brian and I, we're gonna we're gonna try this one more time, and I think where we'll start is just by kind of getting into the categories in just a second. But I do want to point out this is the second movie that I saw at a drive-through. The first one was The Shadow, which we talked about a few months ago. I saw this as a double double feature with Dumb and Dumber, which we will talk about a little bit later, but. For the, for the purposes of our own sanity, we're going to get right into the categories, and this podcast will probably end up being a little bit shorter than the typical episode, just because it's, it's really tough to rehash some of the things that we talked about. But in talking about the heroes, of course, there is a brand new Batman. It is Val Kilmer, which if in 2019 you're wondering how the hell did that happen, I think I was still even wondering this in 1995. Val Kilmer at this point, was a bit of a rising star. He had some supporting roles in movies such as Tombstone and Heat, and I think he had the jawline that they were looking for. And Michael Keaton really did not have a lot of interest in repeating this role for a third time. He did meet with Joel Schumacher, apparently, and declined to join the project after deciding that he did not like the direction in which Schumacher was looking to take the franchise. And there was even a point when Tim Burton was considering coming back and perhaps only doing a movie featuring the Riddler. But then once Joel Schumacher came on, then it was also Two-Face put into this movie, in keeping with the tradition of having two villains in this movie. And Michael Keaton did not like the idea of lightening things up, and that's exactly what Joel Schumacher was being tasked to do. Even though Joel Schumacher himself has said that he was very interested in the idea of doing something a little bit darker, maybe even doing a take on the Batman Year One comic books, but that was not meant to be, as we ended up with something that was definitely not Batman 1989 or Batman Returns. And one of the things that he didn't want to do was to explore Bruce Wayne's growing fear that his crusade to be Batman had done more harm than good and that Bruce was beginning to suffer from burnout. But the executives at Warner Brothers insisted on a lighter tone. What we did get, though, was much more of Bruce Wayne. Spends a lot of the film interacting with Dr. Chase Meridian, played by Nicole Kidman, who we'll talk about in just a second, but the differences here are very obvious. There's a lot more Batman and there's a lot more Bruce Wayne in this movie, and if it was Michael Keaton, this probably would be a great decision, but because it's Val Kilmer, I don't think it is. I do not like his delivery. I think it's it's very monotone, and I think that one of the big issues with his performance is that it does not jive with everything else that is going on in the movie. And perhaps part of that is because Tommy Lee Jones and Jim Carrey had a desire to go so over the top that there is no possible way they could have been met. But this this whole movie is meant to be a cartoon, and Val Kilmer does not seem to know what movie he's in. He's got this very serious tone that I kind of enjoyed. Like, I, I enjoy his take on Bruce Wayne. Like, to me... He had that Bruce Wayne character down. Problem is, he's a bad Batman. He's not charismatic at all as Batman. He doesn't have that physicality as Batman. He's missing a lot uh, when he puts on the cowl. But when he's Bruce Wayne, he's really good. Like, I really like him in that corporate role, that face he puts on when he has to be that Bruce Wayne corporate leader. Um, I really enjoyed his work in that. But, again, like you mentioned, it's just this tonal difference where he's trying to be serious and everyone around him is just, like, out to lunch trying to make their own movie and do these wacky performances that they don't care about. And it seems like Val Kilmer's, like, the only one that really cares and he's trying so hard to give this character, like, pathos and give it seriousness that it deserves and, you know, the recognition it deserves. But once he puts on the cowl and starts fighting the bad guys, it just becomes that campy 60s Batman that doesn't mesh up totally well at all and becomes tone deaf at times. But... There are some stretches where he's talking to Robin that I really enjoy. So when he's not Batman, I like Val Kilmer as Bruce Wayne. All right, we'll get to Robin in just a second here, but there are apparently some issues with Kilmer and Schumacher on set, and perhaps that is one of the contributing factors to Val Kilmer not returning under the cowl for Batman and Robin. In addition, one of the things that Val Kilmer said in regards to this film is that because of this, that he would get other opportunities to do other bigger mainstream movies or maybe do some of his own projects. And I think for many actors, that is the allure of doing these movies is that you are going to perhaps be able to have more creative freedom after you are done with this role. And that's certainly something that Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. also were both interested in now that they are done with their respective roles for the most part. And I think that's what Val Kilmer was doing. And 
Uh, I'm not sure it necessarily worked out because he's not really someone that you hear a great deal about. I know that he had probably his best role in most in most recently was in Kiss 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 Bang Bang, and that was 12 years ago. Yeah, and so far removed from Batman Forever. But I get I I get what you're saying. And you're right. He did ha- he did have more freedom to make choices on his roles. But you know, I think after that, his biggest role after that might have been what the Saint. And I think there was that one where he went hunting in Africa. That might have been before this one. But, you know, there was... This is, like, Val Kilmer's biggest movie, and I don't think he wants to accept that. It feels like, but, you know, that's what he has to accept. Like, maybe Top Gun number two. But um, it, it sucks, because you kind of feel that he was one and done. Like, you watch his performance, and it just seems like... It seems like he's not coming back, because he's so... It's, it's just so disconnected from everyone else in terms of the performances. But it did feel like it was one and done. And I think the other issue is that so much of the Batman stuff does not feel like it does not feel like it pays off. It's like they put all these things into the movie. They even put a deleted scene where there where Batman was literally confronting a bat in a dreamlike sequence, and that isn't something that's really ever paid off. There is a point when Bruce Wayne decides that he's going to give up being Batman, and that's a decision that it may be a TV show where you have ten episodes and he spends two or three episodes not being Batman. That's something that works, but. This is a two-hour movie, and one of the most important characters in this movie, Chris O'Donnell playing Robin, he's not introduced until 45 minutes or so in during the circus sequence. And I think there are aspects of Chris O'Donnell that I think work as as a performer. I think the way that he was kind of seen at this point was as the next Tom Cruise. And I say that because if you look at how Chris O'Donnell the way his career trajectory was going, the mo- a recent movie that he had appeared in before this was Scent of a Woman, which was Al Pacino's movie that he won an Academy Award for, and he was kind of like Tom Cruise was in The Rain Man, and unfortunately, Chris O'Donnell plays this role, and he plays the role in Batman and Robin. I don't think his performance is very good. I think he's very unlikable in this role. And I think there are times when they are clearly trying to make him seem hip and cool. He has an earring. He's doing neon motorcycle races. He's arguing with uh, the older generation. He's doing parkour laundry. So there, there's all this effort to make Chris O'Donnell seem cool and hip, but there's very little effort into actually making him seem likable. And he seems to be constantly arguing with Bruce Wayne in his very one note about killing Two-Face. And I think that there is a potentially interesting payoff. And they almost went for it with Robin saving Two-Face, preventing Two-Face from dying. But then Two-Face ends up dying at the end of the movie anyway because of Batman. And... I think that there's just a lot of mixed messaging going on. I don't know how you feel about Chris O'Donnell, but for me, he is somebody that I have a lot of problems with in this role. He was fairly decent at the start of the movie. Like, when he, you know, has that stretch, you know, like, I think the stretch between the circus up until, you know, uh, Batman puts on the cowl again, pretty much. So, like, a 15-minute sequence, him and just Bruce Wayne trying to connect, or Bruce Wayne trying to connect with him, I thought that was pretty good. Like, that showed him, like, it, it kind of, like, reflected, you know, his past trauma as a kid, going through the same thing, Bruce losing his parents, Robin losing his parents, or Dick Grayson in this case, but um, it, I like that little parallel there, and they try to play off of that, but um, again, it kind of just falls apart with the wackiness, you know, to come when they put on the cowl and becomes Batman and Robin, and all that wacky stuff goes down, but when they're trying to just be, you know, like, heart-to-heart, trying to, like, you know, comfort him, I, that kind of works for me. But that's just them being human, you know what I mean? Not putting on the the suits and being all, you know, hero-like. So um, I like his performance in that respect, but then he gets whiny and stuff, and then he gets really whiny in Batman and Robin, but he does get really whiny by the end, and then it becomes that mixed message, you're right, because he does save him, but then Batman kills him, or kills Two-Face accidentally, however you want to interpret it, but um, it it definitely sends the mixed message. And he does want a partner, and that's kind of what he kind of tells Bruce at the end, he wants a partner, um... And I think that, you know, that kind of works, but it's just, again, too rushed for everything. And the idea, I do like the idea of him connecting with Alfred, because Alfred is good at connecting with, like, people in need when, when they're in times of trauma. So I like that little aspect of it. So Robin was originally supposed to appear in the first two movies. At one point, Kiefer Sutherland had been offered the role for the 1989 Batman, but turned it down. Marlon Wayans, which would have been a very interesting choice. He was actually signed on and did a costume test, which I don't know if there's ever been photos, but I desperately would like to see what Marlon Wayans in the Robin outfit looks like. 
and Wayans was slated to play the role in this film while Tim Burton was still on board. But when Joel Schumacher took over, Wayne's contract was bought out. This is the first of two buyouts of black actors on this movie, Brian. And we'll get to the other one in just a moment. But it is worth noting that on the same day of the 30th anniversary of the 1989 Batman coming to theaters, it also happens to be the same date as the Marlon Wayans starring vehicle known as White Chicks. It is that movie's 15th anniversary as well. So Batman and White Chicks are forever linked. In more ways than one, apparently. But <laughs> one of those strange little Hollywood stories that you hear and then you kind of read about it and then, and then you confirm it's true. It's like one of those crazy things in Hollywood that's happened. But, you know, I, in terms of, like, casting, I kind of put this out on Twitter uh, a week back or two, but I think River Phoenix would have been a great young Robin. I love him in the beginning of uh, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, that first 15 minutes as young Indiana Jones. I thought he would have been a great Robin, kind of looking back, but unfortunately he died too early. But he, he fits that that role perfectly, that age group perfectly, because I think Chris O'Donnell's a little too older, but they're trying to portray him as, like, a 17-year-old going into college kind of thing. So that's, you can kind of cast an older guy for that, but he would have been perfect just with that look kind of like the same way that Tom Holland is for Spider-Man, I think. Absolutely. I think Alfred and Commissioner Gordon are again on the sideline. We're not going to have a really good Commissioner Gordon discussion until either Batman Begins or maybe even The Dark Knight. But now we could talk about Chase Meridian, who is a terrible doctor because he's basically trying to date a patient who is Bruce Wayne and is obsessed with Batman. And one of the biggest complaints and one of the biggest tropes that you see in movies, and this is something that I think still happens to an extent, but was much more prevalent in the 90s, is that you have these very attractive women. And Nicole Kidman, there's no doubt that she is a very attractive woman. And she is under the covers naked, or she's wearing very short skirts, or she's wearing uh, outfits that clearly are there for a specific reason. And they compensate for the lack of character and the lack of any development by just having her be a doctor. And I think the most egregious example of this is Denise Richards in one of the James Bond movies, I believe it's The World Is Not Enough, where they had her as a nuclear physicist, and it was just absurd because they're clearly trying to to have, quote-unquote, a female character, but in reality, she's not. And you could see some of the sexism involved here because Rene Russo was originally cast to play Dr. Chase Meridian when Michael Keaton was still attached to the project as Batman. However, when Keaton dropped out of the project and was replaced by Val Kilmer, Russo was deemed too old to play his love interest despite being just shy of six year six years Kilmer Sr. So just absolutely absurd. And Nicole Kidman, who is seven and a half years younger than Kilmer, I don't think she's very good in the role. And I've seen Nicole Kidman in a lot of recent movies be very good. I think she's really good on Big Little Lies, which is on HBO. And I think you've seen her career develop, and I think she's done a lot of really good work. For a lot of reasons, this is not this is not it. Yeah, it takes a while for her to for her career to kind of take off. I would say probably what two thousand ish Moulin Rouge, the others. That's when she kind of started getting credibility because those movies were you know highly acclaimed at the time. It got all those uh, nominations and stuff. So it just took her a while for her career to kind of take off. And you can tell she's very green in this role. And like you said, it's just kind of like these tropes that they keep throwing at us. And it's the third movie in a row where Batman's love interest discovers that, you know, he's Batman in his house. You know what I mean? That's just ridiculous. Three blondes in a row discovering that <laughs> it's Batman in his house. It's it's getting tiresome. So the, it feels like they just keep rewriting these roles, just changing the actresses, changing the names, keeping the same obsession of, like, who's Batman? Who's this guy? I'm attracted to him. I'm attracted to the mystery and the darkness. And then it turns out you just want Bruce Wayne at the end because he's the normal one. So it's just kind of, like, weird that they play it like that and kind of obsessive. And then by the end of the movie, you just want Bruce Wayne anyway, so... Not a great performance, very lackluster, but it's not necessarily her fault. I think Joel Schumacher is good at, you know, uh, directing story, like narratives, but not necessarily getting the best performances out of his actors. Right, and I don't really have a good place to put these other three minor notes, so I'm just going to put them at the end here. John Favreau, who I actually noticed on this rewatch, I don't even know how, because John Favreau looks very different in 1995 than he does in 2019, but he is uh, playing a Wayne Enterprises bodyguard 
which is fascinating because you can really see the uh, the history of superhero filmmaking because he is in this movie. He has a bit of a more prominent role in the 2003 Daredevil movie. And of course, he has played Happy Hogan in some of the Iron Man and Avengers movies. And of course, he is the person who really kicked off the MCU by directing the first two Iron Man movies. And he is somebody who is very prominent in the history of of Disney. So John Favreau being in this movie is kind of a fun historical note. There's also the security guard at the very beginning. Again, this feels like a 1966 Batman thing. He sounds exactly like Roger Rabbit to the point where I went to IMDb to see if it actually was the person who played Roger Rabbit. It was not, but it's 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 so cartoony and so bad. And of course, Brian, there's also the guy at the circus who shouts, "Batman! Yeah!" Hilarious. Yeah, but regarding that security guard, mate, it's exactly like Mort from Family Guy, like that same like stereotype, I guess. And then, oh no, the acid! It, it, my, my shoes are melting! Oh no! It, it, just terrible, terrible. All right, so my score is a two. Again, I'm not a fan of either Val Kilmer or Chris O'Donnell. I think there are a couple good hero moments at the circus. I think there are a couple good bat- moments in some of the early parts of the movie, but I really think this movie falls apart, especially in the third act. And all I can say is, Brian, there's a very, there's a very bad line that Robin says that we're going to get to in just a few minutes. But man, this movie is from the hero's perspective. This is easily one of the worst. Um, man, I just like Val Kilmer as Bruce Wayne. So I'm going to give it a five. And I know that seems kind of high, but him as Bruce Wayne is like the ideal Bruce Wayne in my head. He's got his hair slicked back he carries himself well. He pretends to be this business guy, makes business decisions, but deep down he knows he's Batman. But the problem is when he's when he's Batman, it sucks. So, you know, there's that dichotomy within the dichotomy, I guess. All right, let's take people back to 1994 as we start talking about the villains category. Let's talk about Jim Carrey. I don't think people understand how big Jim Carrey was in 1995 and 1996. Back when making $20 million was a big deal, this was a, a very important part of the movie The Cable Guy, and he is one of the most prominent names listed on the poster for this movie. But when you have the triumvirate of Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber, regardless of what you think of those movies now, and I think in a lot of ways, the, the all three movies, for very different reasons, have aged poorly. I think they've all, they've all had kid series uh, based off of them. They have also had really bad sequels based off of them. I think Dumb and Dumber had both a dumb prequel and a dumb sequel. But those movies were enormous hits. And Jim Carrey was kind of of a new wave of comedians and comedic personalities. I think him and Adam Sandler kind of mirrored each other in a way. Adam Sandler, of course, is is very different. But around the same time, he was definitely he was also making movies a, a, not as big to start with. Jim Carrey was definitely the bigger star at this point. But it's funny to see the fact that yes, Adam Sandler is still kind of making his his doing his thing, and you can think of that whatever you will. But it just feels like. Jim Carrey is somebody I feel like I have to explain the fact that he was a big star because he, he is he has devolved into self parody. The Netflix documentary about him playing Andy Kaufman, I don't think it helps the fact that he is playing Robotnik and basically doing the same stick that he was in nineteen ninety four. I don't think that really helps him either. So in this movie you are getting the full Jim Carrey experience as the Riddler, where he is basing a lot of his performance on Frank Gorshin and that portrayal of the character. So again, it makes again makes this feel like a cartoon. It was a big deal at the time, because I remember it being a big deal at the time. Like, I remember, like, I'm not a fan of Dumb and Dumber, and that movie I didn't really watch as a kid, but Ace Ventura was a big, like, rental as a kid. I remember renting that, and, like, you know, I remember the guy at the video store telling my dad that, like, this is a big, really big comedy movie, and watching it with my dad. You know, that was a big deal, and then I saw The Mask in theaters, so Jim Carrey was a big star, you know what I mean? Like, in 94, he was a huge star, and... You know, it feels like comedians, like, kind of have that rise to, like, movie stardom. Like, years before, it was probably Eddie Murphy. And then Jim Carrey kind of took that mantle, and it seems like Adam Sandler kind of took that mantle as well. But then Adam Sandler kind of brought it back on the Netflix level. But um, it's just crazy to see how big he was to go from, like, where he was in, like, 91. You know what I mean? Like, in Living Color. So it's just cool to see, like, his growth and rise to, to Hollywood fame and, you know, stardom. And then he kind of peaks around 2000 with, like, maybe The Majestic. I don't know. But um, 
he I think he's worth the money because he was such a big deal that like you, I can only imagine just his name alone on rentals VHS rentals alone probably helped a lot with this movie as well just because it's a name of course and I think with Jim Carrey he is his usual self he's got a lot of very manic energy and I'm not sure how well that ages to 25 years the worst part of this though is his plot makes no sense and even the way that the the impetus for him turning into the brother from Edward Nigma makes no sense because he basically causes his boss to jump off and kill himself but then he somehow doctors the footage and the footage looks too good for it to actually happen. And from there, it just kind of devolves. And basically, in the span of a week, he goes from fired to a billionaire. Yeah, he dominates the cable industry in one week. So basically, he wants to create some virtual reality 3D streaming TV service that goes straight into your brain, like from the brain waves, from the cable box, in your brain. And at the same time, he figured out, well, I guess I can steal information too as well, and he didn't even realize that until he killed his boss when testing the machine on him. So who would have thunk it, right? Then he dominates the cable industry because he introduces it the next day, creates his own company the next day, and then rises to one of the top companies in all of Gotham, even just as rich as Wayne Enterprises, apparently, all within like a week. Does that make any sense? Makes absolutely no sense. And despite all of this... I think Jim Carrey's the best performance in this movie. Yeah, because I guess he's, you know, he's really going for it and he's trying, but again, it's just like Jim Carrey doing Jim Carrey, you know what I mean? So obviously it's going to be over the top and crazy and very physical and him moving around and jumping all over the place and laughing like crazy. But, you know, at the same time, I can't help but think that, like, is this too much? Is it, you know, way too over the top? Like, Frank Gorshin was not nearly as crazy was Jim Carrey too crazy? I don't know. Was it the 90s? Was it cocaine? I don't know. All I know is that Tommy Lee Jones hated his ass. That is apparently true as we transition into talking about Two-Face. Now, you might remember from our Batman 1989 discussion that the district attorney, Harvey Dent, was played by Billy D. Williams. Williams accepted the role with the knowledge and expectation that he, Dent would eventually become Two-Face. He reportedly had a clause put into his contract reserving the role for him in any sequels, which Warner Brothers, again, had to buy out. Again, that's two black actors that were bought out. So we critiqued the X-Men franchise for their treatment of minority characters. We should probably be treating Batman very similarly for just buying out their black actors instead of letting them perform in these roles. And of course, Tommy Lee Jones coming off an Academy Award winning performance in The Fugitive takes over the role. His son, Austin, who was 11 at the time, said Two-Face was his favorite character. Here's the problem with Tommy Lee Jones playing this role. He is trying to out-crazy Jim Carrey, and that is something you cannot simply do. Tommy Lee Jones is a grumpy old man. He has been this way now and forever. He has been 45 years old for the last 50 years, ever since his career first started. And I think you look at a movie like Captain America, that is the ideal use of Tommy Lee Jones because he plays a grumpy general. That That is Tommy Lee Jones. He does not need to turn the volume up or down. That is who he is. The fact that he serves almost no plot purpose in this movie except to chase Batman at random times and there literally was a random car chase that came out of nowhere. He doesn't really have a scheme. He's just a homicidal maniac and his makeup sucks. Yeah, and then the way they show him getting his Two-Face, the way he became Two-Face, obviously, uh, this gangster in a courtroom throws acid in his face, but Batman can't catch the gangster in time so instead of blaming the gangster for scarring his face he blames batman for not saving him in time and blames batman for getting scarred does that make any sense also in this movie or in this they show the footage of that incident right so apparently during that courtroom trial they had a two camera setup not one but two because they had to cut the batman from a different camera angle so i don't know what kind of camera setup they got going on in this news network fictional world but Man, a two-camera setup for a courtroom trial with a gangster? Unbelievable uh, money to have there. Absolutely. And you think about some of the camera work that was going on with Edward Nigma and this. What was 1995 like in Gotham City? Yeah, and everything was just like almost borderline HD. You already had streaming video here and there. They were kind of ahead of its time, just didn't have HD footage. And uh, also one little note, the idea that Two-Face gets replaced kind of makes me accept the idea that this is a completely different Batman universe than... Batman and Batman Returns, the whole rechanging of uh, Two Face and Harvey Dent, changing him and swapping him out, swapping out Batman. It's just easier to accept that this is a different universe than the first two. Right. So, my villain score, I'm also giving this a two. 
I think Jim Carrey, again, he's the best performance in this movie, but there's just so much going on with his plot that I don't think works. I think his scene with Bruce Wayne is utterly absurd because it's it's so obsessive and so manic, and it, it doesn't feel like it's a real movie at this point. And I think the energy of Jim Carrey and the energy of Val Kilmer really don't jive at all. And again... I, I don't like Tommy Lee Jones in this performance, so for all those reasons, I have to give this a two. Yeah, Tommy Lee Jones just seems like he doesn't want to be there, and from the first scene you can tell he's just reading lines and not caring, and just literally reading lines from a page, and he's probably drunk too, the way it seems. So I'm going to give it a three, only because I couldn't help but chuckle a few times by the Riddler and what Jim Carrey was doing, saying it just, I don't know. It would have given it two, but I chuckled, so I'll give it that, and I'll give it a three. All right, let's talk about the story. So there is, of course, a lot more focus on Batman. We've got books and ropes. I'm sorry, we have books and roses and bats? That's what, that's, I guess that explains Kiss on a Rose then, huh? Yeah, just that uh, whole subplot of uh, Rose is just lighting there right on the table, and uh, they made it just for the music video. All right, Batman thwarts Two-Face, and this almost immediately feels like the 1966 television show with Batman talking about getting drive through and being trapped in a container. And specifically in the DMs, I, I mentioned this moment, and I'm like, and so it begins. Yeah, and that's that exact line that they took for the McDonald's commercial that was playing on loop that I saw almost every day as a kid, seeing Batman going through the drive through which was cut for the movie, actually. Uh, and him getting a Big Mac, but also him using that scene telling Alfred I'm going to get drive through Just classic 90s capitalism marketing strategies that the 90s are just known for. Harvey Dent's turn is somehow more absurd in this movie than in The Dark Knight, I think, because at least in The Dark Knight, I think they justify the fact that it could be Batman's fault. The CGI also looks way better. I know you are somebody who is a practical person, but I just think the way the Two-Face looks in this movie is is bad. And I think in general, just doing this character in live action is so, so difficult because I think the character itself looks like a cartoon. And when you're doing the animated series, I think it absolutely works. I think you could figure a way to do it where it makes sense. Here, I don't think it works. I think even in The Dark Knight, this is something they struggle with. And I think it's going to be really hard for them to do Two-Face again, just because of the design of this character. I think there are ways to do different iterations of the Joker, of the Penguin, of the Riddler, but it's really hard to do Two-Face. Yeah, I agree, because, I mean, the reason that Dark Knight works, we'll talk about that in a few weeks, is just because it's burning, like actual burns, not like acid or some shit like that, because acid is very, like, the way that you kind of, like, you know, show acid burning on camera is kind of controversial, because we never know exactly to what extent that acid is supposed to burn, so it kind of becomes this thing where it's subjective, so I think it's kind of wacky anyway, so I do like the idea that it's burning, or burns marks from, like, fire or something like that, um, yeah, and then his plot, the plot of just the Riddler making these riddles, and then the, the he gives Bruce Wayne all these riddles, and the big answer to all the riddles is just Enigma. He just wanted to reveal his name to him, which is stupid. You could have just told his name from the beginning and just not waste your time. And they figured out that, that Bruce Wayne was Batman, and yet they went to his house, and they didn't shoot him in the, in the head and just messed with him and blew up his Batcave and, I don't know, wasted a bunch of time. They knew he was Batman, and they just let him do nothing and just sit there and... Get his back cave blown up. It was horrible. Yeah, the the Riddler in the in the back cave is definitely one of those moments where you're wondering just what in the hell you're watching. I agree with you. I think the best sequence in this movie is it does take place at the circus. I think there's the most pathos with Chris O'Donnell as Robin seeing his family dying. Um, and Wayne taking him in. We get, again, the parkour laundry. We get Chase studying Batman. She and Robin get captured, and Batman is... They, they say he's supposed to make a choice, but it doesn't really happen at all. And this is something that, they, that I think is done much better in one of the Spider-Man movies. And I think the best way to really just sum up this this story portion is, holy rusted metal, Batman! Yeah, yikes. I'm going to go... I'm going to go with a three. Um, it's just tough to give this anything higher because I do love the circus stuff. And I do like that Batman all of a sudden is having these like daydream flashbacks of like some the trauma from his childhood that he was repressing. 
and it seems like there was like a trigger from the incident of the circus, but they don't really acknowledge that. And then the payoff to all these back, you know, you know, these flashes and uh, dream sequences is that he remembers a book that he had that was insignificant in the first place. So just terrible writing with all that buildup as well that went to nothing. So. You know, I do love the cir- the circus stuff though because that's that's straight out of the comics. I think it's Dark Victory where uh, it's a sequel to the Long Halloween where he meets Robin in the circus and Robin is much younger. But at least in that sequence, Robin got to be the hero before he was even Robin and throw the bomb out of the roof. So I thought that was really cool. Right, and I'm going to go with you on that. I'm going to say that the story score is a three. I think there are a couple aspects of this that I don't totally despise, and I don't think that this is pile of shame worthy, but it is it is awfully close. Let's get to the technical aspects of this movie because I think it's pretty weak. I think the score is really repetitive and it's just the same thing over and over and over again, which is funny because they use the Tim Burton score in the trailers for both this movie and Batman and Robin and it just offends my sensibilities given how bad the score is. I do not like the look of either one of these two movies and I know that, they're again, just the way that everything looks, it just does not look like anything but a cartoon everything feels very like on a higher level and some of the neon it feels very 1990s in a lot of places and doesn't really feel like a a timeless part of kind of this universe and i think one of the things that i really love about even batman the animated series is that the time is kind of nebulous and yes there are robots and there are guns and there's some things that make it feel technologically advanced but there's also blimps and there's also kind of a classic style to some of the dress so you're creating a timeless quality and i think that's what some of the best batman movies do is that they they feel timeless this does not feel that it feels very 1990s in the worst possible ways, even with some of the ways that the computers look in this movie. So for all of those reasons, my technical score is a three as well. Uh, I'm going to go with a four, and the CGI is terrible with all the exterior shots of Gotham City, and they just didn't have CGI put together at the time, and they couldn't put together good set piece or mini set pieces just to do wide shots. I thought that was pretty lazy. Um... But I do like this fall look that they're going for around Wayne Manor. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, it obviously takes place in the fall, and everything's, they're wearing these fall kind of clothing. So I like that when when everything seems kind of grounded. Like I said, those 15 minutes from the circus until when he becomes Batman again. Um, everything seems normal and grounded and feels like, like a normal drama. And then that part I like because everything looks good and normal there, and you see the motorcycles and Bruce Wayne trying to connect with Robin. So that part looks good. But then the music sucks. Uh, the costumes are way too over the top, and I really don't like the Two-Face look because it looks just like plastic. It looks like he's wearing plastic instead of like makeup where the makeup moves and moves with the muscle fa- uh, and the texture on the face. It just looks like he's wearing plastic on his face that's not moving, and it takes away from the performance. So I didn't like that at all. Um, and then I kind of like the, the Riddler's suit at the end when he's got the white with the, the green. Um, question mark. I thought that's a unique look that we never usually see the the Riddler in. I don't think we still have actually, but I like when you have like alternate like uh, suits and alternate colorways. I'm a fan of that, so that kind of you know cements my four for me. All right, let's talk about the legacy of this movie. It was very successful. I mean, we have to be honest and say that this was a very successful movie that basically warranted another one that would come in this franchise. And I think that a lot of people tried to pretend that this movie wasn't bad at the time, but I think people have, have kind of come around to it. I think there's a lot of really bad dialogue that we've kind of talked about. But on the other hand, there's two aspects of this movie that I think are positive. I think uh, a lot of the LGBTQ plus community have embraced aspects of this movie, and it's about Batman and Robin's partnership. And we really have not had a prominent gay or bi or trans superhero up to this point. I think that is something that is going to change in the very near future, even with a, a superhero show like Batwoman. It's changing in small ways, but I think in 1995, I think there is certainly a very queer aspect to this movie, especially given that Joel Schumacher is the director of this film. And, of course, there's uh, there's Kiss of a Rose, which is an enormously successful song. The music video tangentially relates to this movie. I'm not sure how to feel about its connection to the movie, but I think the song is so popular. It won multiple Grammy Awards. And I'm not just talking about small 
insignificant Grammys. We're talking Record of the Year, Song of the Year, things like that. So that is part of the legacy of this movie, whether you like it or not. And it is something that still is a prominent song, even to this day, very recognizable. And if I know it's it's not hip to like adult contemporary music, but this is a song that people are going to sing along to. And for all those reasons, my legacy score is actually the highest of these scores at a five. Oh, and Brian, there's also the Batman thumbs up gift, too. Like, how could I forget? Of course, of course. But yeah, it, this was such a big song. Like, we can't talk enough about this song. Like, it is the legacy of this movie more so than not, I think. Um, um, I can't believe that, like, it still plays on the radio today. Like, whenever I do projects on the side, I kind of listen to Coast 103.5 here in L.A., and it's adult contemporary, and they play all the old-school R&B and, you know, love songs and all that kind of stuff that's kind of, like, easy listening for the background. And every time I put it on, they play Kiss from a Rose. So every day that song is played somewhere on some radio station still to this day. So that, that's that got to be, you know, some significant kind of legacy, right? So I'm going to give it a six. Uh, it's all from that and the marketing. Like, I had the cups from, I think it was McDonald's or something like that. Uh, the toys from McDonald's. I, like I mentioned, the McDonald's commercial. Uh, this was a big marketing machine. Uh, they wanted to keep that marketing machine going from the first two. Where in, you know, in Batman Returns, they kind of couldn't do as much. That's probably why I don't remember as much of the marketing as a kid because you know a lot of that movie, and like I said before, is not for kids. This one more oriented towards kids, a lot brighter, a lot you know, um, a lot more poppy. You know what I mean? And more you know, more acceptable for kids. So that's why I kind of remember it more. I think. All right, so my total score is a 15, and yours is... 21. So the total score for Batman Forever is officially a 36, which means that it is well short of falling into the pile of shame. Although this is not a great movie, this is not a good movie, there are a couple redeeming qualities to it. I certainly would not tell people to go out of their way to see it uh, unless you haven't and you want to see what a 1990s Batman movie looks like. And I think it is it is very much a product of its time, but it is certainly not rock bottom for the franchise. Yeah, I mean, I own the Blu-ray only because it came with a four-pack for like 15 bucks, so... I would say in that sense, yeah, buy of the four pack of the first of the eighty nine Batman all the way to Batman and Robin because it's I think it's worth owning for on the cheap and then looking back on Blu Ray it's even more fascinating because you see all the little details and how what we thought looked cool in ninety five probably on VHS does not nearly look as cool now on Blu Ray. All right, let's buzz through these burning questions quickly here. First off, how much is Joel Schumacher to blame for this movie being bad? I got to go around 60% because I feel like despite how much, how much of an influence the producers and the executives had in his ear and what they wanted, you still have some control over your set, I feel, as a director, and you need to have that kind of control. And to kind of have that lack of control and have some like inexcusable like type performances like from this movie. But like I said before, I don't think that's Schumacher's strength. I think his strength is like putting a good narrative together, like Lost Boys, and then kind of like putting the performances aside. So that's why I'm like my go-to my go-to Schumacher film is probably going to be always Lost Boys because I think Lost Boys is better than these two Batman movies. And there's also Falling Down with Michael Douglas, which might be one of the best movies of that type ever. I have mixed feelings on that movie. I don't know. I saw it a long time ago. It didn't affect me as much as most, but we can discuss that another time. Absolutely, and I think it's really hard to put the blame on Schumacher totally, even 60%. I think even me saying 20 to 30% might be a little bit high because so much of this movie, I think there's a lot to blame with the executives who wanted this movie to be so much more different, so much more connected to the marketing. I think the screenwriting is a huge problem. I think Akiva, Akiva Goldsman is such a mixed bag, and I think that's one of the other major problems with this. All right, is Val Kilmer the worst Batman ever? No, he's bottom three in the worst Batmans, but he's a pretty good Bruce Wayne, so I'll leave it at that. And I, I want more of a Val Kilmer-type Bruce Wayne in my Bruce Waynes. All right, I would have to say that I think he is. I, I, and we can maybe get into this once we talk about more Batmans, but I think even even worse than like your Diedrich Baders and Kevin Conroy's and Will Arnett's, I mean, I just don't think that he captures this role at all as either Batman or Bruce Wayne. So uh, that is very frustrating. What is your one word review of Seal's Kiss of a Rose music video? Sexy. Inconceivable. 
Tell me, who is afraid of the big black bat? Um, I guess the Riddler now, even though he's so smart that now he's afraid of a giant bat and he can't even remember who Batman is when he went through all that trouble to figure him out. I'm going to say that it is, uh, it's Bruce Wayne. If you've seen some of the deleted scenes, he looks pretty nervous about being around that bat. And I can't say that I blame him because that bat's pretty scary. What is your dread level for watching and reviewing Batman and Robin next week? Uh, six. I mean, I, I don't remember being that bad, but who knows? I mean, it's been a while since I watched it, so I could be wrong on that end, but uh, I'll say six for now. I'm going to say seven or an eight because this, I mean, the reason that it's taken us so long to get through to the Batman franchise, part is part of it is because we wanted to do a lot of MCU stuff, but I really don't want to watch rewatch these movies, and I have to for this podcast, and I'm, I'm really excited to get to everything after this movie. But man, next week's going to be a tough one as we will indeed be reviewing Batman and Robin and then we will we will hit uh hit our stride so to speak. Uh so for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening this week. We will talk to you again next week as we will talk about the movie The Pile of Shame was invented for. Was that a little too over the top? <laughs>